Volcanoes, earthquakes, glaciers, and tsunamis, all a part of Alaska's geology. The truth and history about Mother Nature's natural hazards explained on The Fault in the Facts with Michaela Clark. Welcome to The Fault in the Facts. I'm Michaela Clark. Here, we talk about the truth and history of Mother Nature and explain her natural hazards. In this episode, we're going to be talking about the world's largest earthquakes in 2020 and 2021. The story of these two quakes will help us understand the question, can one earthquake cause another? I spoke with expert Ronnie Grappentin, who explained his research. So in July 2020, there was a 7.8 quake that hit off the coast of the Aleutian chain near the Shumagin Islands. That's known as the Simonoff event. And a year later, in July 2021, there was an 8.2 that hit nearby, but to the northeast. It's known as the Chignik event. Your newly released research says that there's a connection between the two. Can you expand on that? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, in the uh, first earthquake, um, that 7.8 in uh, 2020, the Simonov earthquake, uh, some some slip is being released. So if you have uh, if you have two plates kind of um, moving towards each other, one subducting under the other, you uh, you build up some some strain, and that is being released in a in a uh, in a large earthquake. And um, <clears throat> What happens um, during that uh, is that the surrounding areas that don't slip, they experience a higher stress. Um, so, you know, they they feel as if um, the plate has moved a little bit more and they get advanced towards rupture. Uh, and uh, that's what we found for the uh, 20, 2021 uh, Simonov Chignik sequence that the Simonov earthquake in the area where Chignik uh, ended up rupturing increased the stresses uh, and uh, advanced that rupture uh, by a little bit. Uh, that doesn't mean that the Chignik earthquake wouldn't have happened uh, without the Simonov earthquake, but it means that it happened somewhat sooner uh, due to that, and uh, um, that establishes a link between those two earthquakes. With this research, what would you say the answer is to can one earthquake cause another? Uh, I think you know that uh, that research shows this uh, really quite nicely. Um, <clears throat> these earthquakes are uh, right next to each other. Uh, we see higher stresses or stress increases in the area of the Chignik earthquake due to the Simonov earthquake. Um, their rupture areas do not overlap very much. Um, and so they are kind of complementary uh, to one another. And um, uh, certainly the Simonov uh, earthquake impacted or um, helped advance the, the Chignik earthquake. The research shows that after these quakes, the areas may be closer to failure. Does this mean that it, there's a possibility for an even larger quake? Yeah, so you know, what we're showing or um, uh, what we resolved is that um, these two earthquakes uh, ruptured the uh, deeper part of the mega thrust, um, below, mostly below 20 kilometers, um, <clears throat> and released most of the stresses that have accumulated over over the decades uh, since the last uh, large earthquake there. Uh, but the in the shallower part of that uh, area, we do not or the, the shallower part of that mega thrust hasn't ruptured during that uh, during those two events, and uh, we find that uh, both earthquakes increase the uh, the stresses in that region, and uh, there's a um, there's an increased seismic hazard. However, uh, we also see a very large what we call post seismic uh, relaxation. Uh, which means that uh, a lot of that increased stress is actually released as kind of a slow earthquake over the course of uh, weeks to months. And that's something that we are trying to understand now uh, with follow-on studies, whether the uh, shallow portion of that, uh, of that uh, mega thrust is actually going to, is more likely to, to rupture in an earthquake and create a tsunami, or uh, if these post seismic, um, uh, the post seismic relaxation actually releases most or all of that stress, 
uh, which would explain why we haven't seen um, tsunami or substantial tsunami deposits in that area from, uh, from past large earthquakes. The Siminoff and Chignik events are in a part of the Aleutian chain called the Shumagin Gap. Tell me why that's significant. Yeah, so uh, if you have, um, you know, the the entire Aleutian arc, uh, that is a, there's a very long um, mega thrust or, or subduction zone. Uh, and in subduction zones around the world, what we what we found, um, you know, decades ago is that they uh, they all kind of rupture in large earthquakes. They rupture one portion and then another portion and perhaps something a little bit further down here. And later um, they, they fill each other in kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. And uh, in the uh, Aleutian megathrust, uh, what has happened is that, you know, in 1964, we had the magnitude 9.2 Great Alaska earthquake that uh, kind of ruptured all the way uh, west uh, of, of Kodiak. Uh, and then <clears throat> west of the Schumagin Gap, uh, we had the 1946 magnitude uh, 8.6 earthquake. But in between uh, there, there was this area where we would have expected uh, a large earthquake. Uh, but none has happened over the last uh, 100 or so years. Uh, and that's why it's been called the Schumagin seismic gap, because that uh, that last piece that would kind of fill in that um, <clears throat> uh, the, the subduction zone uh, hadn't ruptured yet. Uh, there were only some smaller earthquakes. And now with the Simonov and the Chignik earthquake, at least the deeper portion of that of the Schumagin seismic gap uh, has has ruptured, um, and it's not uh, yeah it's not lagging behind anymore. Thank you so much for taking the time to answer these questions. Thanks for having me. This earthquake came with many aftershocks and a tsunami warning that lasted for hours. Next, we'll hear about the moments it was all happening through the eyes of two women living on Chawiat Island. They were some of the closest people to the epicenter of the largest quake in the United States in more than 50 years. It was a bolt and run kind of instance. Remembering a tense time, Brianna Bodie and Katie Stoner look back on 2021's big quake. They were the only people on a remote island and living in a small cabin. When the wind blows really hard, they do shake a little bit. Stoner stirred from her sleep, wondering if she was feeling a quake. I was saying no, thinking I did kind of shift the cabin a bit when I got up and stood. It's probably just me. And it got quite a bit worse, quite a bit faster. As things were falling from the shelves, they ran outside. I ended up on the trail in my socks. I didn't even put shoes on. <laughs> they watched as the land fell from nearby islands. You could smell the dust in the air as it went on. But from our perspective on the island, we couldn't see anything that had changed, which was a bit of relief. The pair grabbed supplies. It was very traumatic. We weren't sure if the shaking was going to come back. And climbed to higher ground. When we sat down, there was an aftershock that happened and I looked over and the hillside that's covered in ferns had the ferns reverberating with the movement of the ground. <laughs> it was just quite surreal. The birds carried on as they would any other night, bringing comfort. It was kind of like the wildlife and the island was saying, don't worry, we've, we've got this, we've done this, we did the hard part. After the tsunami threat waned, Bodie and Stoner headed back to their cabin. Given the rustic cabin that we lived in, there wasn't really much that could break. In fact, the only fatality in the cabin from this event was one ceramic coffee mug. They crawled into bed without putting everything away in fear it would fall again. I wondered and was worried that the island wouldn't feel the same again because it was our home and we loved being there and then we experienced this trauma. Um, but after a week, maybe a week and a half, we had done all of our rotation of monitoring again and we're safe. And so it started to feel like home again. A home that found a way to bring them comfort and safety while the world around them was shaking apart. Bodhi and Stoner were on the island from May through August and they say they would go back in a heartbeat. And obviously being that close to the United States' largest earthquake in more than 50 years is a scary situation. But they say it left them with lasting memories, this one being Bodhi's favorite.
<laughs> I had the toothbrush in my hand until we started packing and realized that I needed actually two hands to pack. And oh, by the way, I'm still holding this. I was able to catch up with Bodhi again recently, nearly 10 months after she and Stoner went through that 8.2 earthquake. And she says because of their firsthand experience, they were able to help update protocols on what their crew should do when an earthquake hits. We already had most of the gear and have these kinds of circumstances have happened before. And so most of it has been written into our protocols, but we went a little bit more extensively and we're able to change how we're gonna store things so that instead of having to grab everything from the cabin, we may have some opportunity to stash backup of things in places so that there's less to remember in the moment. And in the moment can be very stressful and easy to forget things. She will be doing similar work this summer but on St. Paul Island instead. But this show is called The Fault in the Facts, and I'd like to end with a fact about a fault. For this episode, I'd like to expand a bit more on the earthquakes near the Shumagin Gap. Over the last 80 years, large earthquakes in that area have been grouped together as a sequence of earthquakes. And I asked Gropentine if the sequence is just starting or if it's closer to the end. In our work, we try to investigate that um... To, to some extent, and we came to the conclusion that uh, based on how the stresses have uh, evolved, that it's uh, more likely that those uh, two events are kind of the tail end of that 80 year long uh, cascade of, uh, of earthquakes that ruptured the entire Aleutian arc, uh, rather than being the onset of a, uh, of a new cascade. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of The Fault in the Facts. It's a monthly segment right here on Alaska's news source digital platforms. And we want to know if you have any misconceptions or questions about Mother Nature that you want answered. You can email us at streamingnews at ktuu.com.